from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm very excited about tonight's concert. I've been listening to the rehearsals and everything is sounding uh, really great, so you're in for a real treat. Um, but I'm also uh, very grateful and excited to be uh, joined by uh, composer Brian Fernijo, um, who's here and, and is a recipient of a commission uh, work that will receive its world premiere tonight. And also um, the conductor of Talia, uh, James Baker. Um, and so, uh, we're just going to have a conversation about the piece and about um, some other things and uh, see where that goes. But um, there will also be some time uh, at the end for you to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, so please uh, bear those in mind. So maybe just as a starting point, uh, what can you tell us about the piece? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. You want me to give it away in advance? <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you, David, for the commission um, of the Library of Congress. It's a great honor, of course. Never been here in Washington before. And so it was very interesting to, to walk around a little bit today and uh, get some feel for the, the atmosphere of the, of the building, which is quite extraordinary, of course. Um, let me start answering this question by um, citing another composer, Arnold Schoenberg, who has many works, I think, uh, lodged here and was commissioned also by the Library of Congress in his time. Um, he wrote a book called Style and Idea. And uh, style is fairly clear. You can mm, statistically ascertain, for instance, if a play was by Shakespeare or perhaps by somebody else and then put under his name because there, is, there are stylistic discrepancies. So style is fine, but idea is a very strange word when you apply it to the arts. Um, we don't know, in fact, although books have been written on the topic, whether he was talking about uh, a musical motive, about a way of treating musical motives. Um, we don't know if it was concrete musical material at all. Some of his pieces clearly weren't. I mean, things like Erwartung or Die Glückliche Hand, the, the operatic words, uh, clearly had a, a fundamental idea which, by and large, I suppose came from a mixture of expressionism and Freudian psychology. Uh, but for a, for a composer today, it's an issue which is um, fraught with problems. The idea of a piece of music expressing, incorporating, articulating an idea or a set of ideas uh, is problematic simply because music, although we can treat it like a language, probably is not a language. It doesn't have the semantic context that um, an everyday language has. We can't point to things in music by and large which um, relate to something outside music which can be related back to the inside of music. So um, one of the things that's concerned me over the years has been the idea, uh, indeed, of how much one may derive the nature of a piece of music from some sort of act of prior... Um, conceptualization, yes? And uh, over the years I've done this, I started composing sometime in the late 50s, and um, by the time of the mid-60s, mid early 70s, I was writing works which in some way tried to reflect um, bodies of ideas, if you like, intellectual or s sensible disciplines. Um, they could be histor historic, they could be philosophical, um, they could be something else indeed, poetry or what have you. But I've always felt that contemporary music suffers in many respects by being the art which does not relate easily to the everyday sensations which we um, are party to. And so we find contemporary music more difficult to, to, to uh, enter into Precisely because we have to make certain presuppositions, which A, we are not 
uh, on the whole, used to doing, and B, without knowing if there's presuppositions that one's making, have anything to do with that, with that piece in reality. So uh, I've always looked to see if I can find something in other areas which um, one, can, one can focus on, one can sit on or stand on, one can um, circle around it, rather like an artificial flat earth which is sitting on top of, um, of a tortoise which is sitting on top of an elephant. You know. <laughs> um, of course, the, these things are always, uh, not entirely arbitrary, but these things are a reflection of one's own unease about the means with which one works. And um, part of the drama of contemporary music, in my view, at least since the 70s perhaps, has been uh, understanding how much the sociology of musical creation uh, is involved in the actual creation of musical works. Um, many works uh, have, for instance, certain sorts of uh, mm, improvisatory aspects to them, which implies that the person performing the work, the mediator, is um, aware of the unspoken criteria of rectitude, if you like, which, which, the, which he has to apply to an authentic performance of the work. And so most of my work, certainly the last 10 years, have um, been based upon ideas of this flat earth sort, which can in part be transcribed into musical means, but you, know, you all know program music. Um, Richard Strauss's Alpine Symphony, where you go up a mountain, the sun comes out at midday, you come down, and there are sheep bowing in the meadows. Um, yes, that is program music. Or, or um, Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, for instance. Uh, or uh, Liszt's Scheherazade. All these things are based upon musically external uh, formal markers. Now, uh, this is something I try to distance myself from, or you can't, you can't do it entirely. Um, okay, this piece, Contra Colpi. Uh, why Italian? Well, it sounds good in Italian. <laughs> uh, and uh, if I were to put it in um, German, um, Gegenschlag, or Gegenschläge, if you want to put it, uh, it would have implications about the philosophy of Hegel, and lately of the philosophy of Zizek and um, his neo-Marxian sort of rhetoric. And I, whilst that's not entirely um, mm, out of the ballpark, nevertheless, I obviously don't want people to have to have the presupposition of listening and reading philosophy in order to hear my music. It's not, it's not sounding philosophy in any means at all. Um, although I might have argued otherwise in 40 years ago, I don't know. Yes, so um, English, there isn't really a word, uh, counterblow. I guess the word most used would be, um, what is the word now? Um, uh, rebound, recoil, I believe that's the word, yes. And it's in, a, in effect, a lot of things in music um, attempt to take different musical objects or ways of working, bring them together, and in so doing, create a sort of third synthesis which demonstrates the skill of the composer and also provides unexpected perspectives for the listener who has followed the process that far. Um, however, this piece implies not um, a sort of dialectical process of that sort, A, B, A, B, somehow mixed up. What it does is present you with two sometimes crassly opposed types of musical stuff. Um, and each of these types of stuff develops in its own particular way over the course of the piece, but cannot avoid, of course, taking cognizance of what the other sort of material is doing, since they are always placed together. They're joined together very, uh, with very sudden breaks. So uh, one of the problems I had when writing this piece, I always think of myself as a fairly, fairly adequate formalist, but of course the idea of taking two totally different things, sticking them, uh, uh, one next to the other over the course of a piece, A, B, A1, B1, and so on, really was something which I, I, I was not particularly easy with in my own, own soul. 
And so that was a challenge. But also, um, it was a challenge not to give in to attempting to make these things so similar that they would be straw men, that I could, uh, uh, I could show my skill uh, because these things didn't offer any recoil, any resistance. And it's the offering of resistance of these things to each other, each in its own way of progression throughout the work, which is basically forms the idea of the composition. Apart from the beginning. The beginning has 12 little sort of things, uh, um, um, resonance, so you've always got one type of thing, resonance, another type of thing, resonance. And the ending is a much e expanded version of that. So we do have these sort of formalists, that you might al almost call them uh, traditionalist ploys with respect to how pieces may begin and pieces may end. Um, but it really was difficult for me to write a piece precisely because each of these things has its own demands to be placed on me. For instance, one of the con major constraints of the first type of material is that it's all built round piano. So you've got piano plus, piano plus plus, uh, piano horn and double bass. And whilst the registers of these things are always changing and um, the density of the materials which are being sort of revolved, like a revolving door, are being brought round and round in a canonic sort of game, um, this sort of thing was entirely unappropriate for the other type of material. So the other type of material is defined ex nihilo. In other words, um, you'd say, oh, this, yes, this is this because it's not something else. And it's an extremely weak thesis to be basing an entire composition on. But it does work. I mean, very often we, we, we recognize that we don't recognize something. So what you'll be hearing in this particular piece is not an attempt to create a global synthesis between to however created, however molded and manipulated stuffs, but um, it's a very, very provisional but insistent attempt to lock them into some sort of interplay, reactive interplay with each other, which does not involve them in taking on the characteristics of its opposite number. One uh, follow-up question uh, <laughs> to that. Uh, uh, Contracolpius uh, answer to that question, that's just to throw out a back <laughs> <laughs> um, would be, um, you mentioned uh, with respect to program music and uh, there's an element of uh, composer fiat that's involved with the, when you're titling, um, and so is the title that then uh, more about uh, the, any sort of programmatic component might be, it's indication of, of a process. Well it is, and that's yeah. why I put it in a language which perhaps is not everyday language for many people. Um, most of my titles are not in English. Those of my titles that are in English are taken from obscure poetic sources. So there's always a sort of second, second level behind these things. And I leave people to, to puzzle. I mean, if you know any Italian, you know, first of all, it's a peculiar spelling, the two C's in the middle. But um, yes, against blows, yes, okay. But if you think of it as recoil, something bangs up against something else which is somewhat intransigent and it bounces off, it gets bent in the process. And it's this bending of both materials to, to accommodate the sort of energy and trajectory of the flow, <coughs> which is really what the expression of the work in my mind is all about. One of the, um, again, I've only had a chance to hear it just a bit in rehearsal, but one of the things that really struck me with respect to your, the bending is the use of steel drums with the keyboard, um, the interplay is really beautiful and you'll enjoy it very much, but that's, you get this, uh, I, just a wonderful sense of it, kind of exploring this inter-realm uh, in terms of the, uh, just what's happening uh, versus the rest of the uh, composition. Well, I use a piano who also, the, the pianist has an electric keyboard as well as a piano. And since the piano is at the center of these first types of material, which you keep on coming around, um, the other sections don't use normal piano. They use a piano keyboard with piano sounds, but tuned in third and sixth tones. So they are, by and large, belonging to a sort of alien universe of expression. You'll particularly hear this at the end of the piece, where I put deliberately put normal pitches and then the same rhythms um, in these microtonal tunings underneath. 
So um, that's the first thing that I've never done before. And the second thing, yes, the, the uh, steel drums. Uh, lovely instruments. I've never used those before either. You know, as you get older, it's good as a young man, or woman for that matter, no doubt, to keep a couple of instruments in reserve. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, harp was one of those. Guitar was certainly one of those 20 years ago. Um, I suppose some instruments just don't fit very well into the contemporary music context, like a, a cornetto or a serpent or something, uh, or a hurdy-gurdy. But the steel drums are perfectly chromatic and perfectly consistent within themselves. I expected them to be much more crass than they are. They're extremely subtle sounding objects. And the players, are, this is the first time they're actually trying to build these things into a composition. I uh, well, um, you know, one other thing that struck me, and then um, I'll move on to maybe uh, James to have some uh, talk about uh, the process of putting together the work. Um, one thing that I was also hearing is that there's a, quite a bit of uh, not just uh, things moving against each other, but also some, uh, I don't know how to describe them, except as maybe um, uh, moments of stasis or, or timbral pedal points almost, or uh, gestural pedal points that are, are those types of, uh, kind of connective tissues, or are those also um, more just uh, extrapolations of, of a particular idea? Well, I promised I wouldn't get into okay, sure. the details, but um, they're not put there, as it were, to allow you to refresh your palate. Or <laughs> I don't go in for culinary comparisons for that, of any sort. But um, they, they, they arise by virtue of the processes which I'm applying to that particular material. It may be in some sections there are more notes there because I've cut less, no uh, fewer notes out. One long note may be there because I've cut out all the notes which would have been around it by following a sort of um, some sort of intellectual erasure. And a lot of things that I, I I do in my music start out as a tremendous sort of bustle of materials like the rhythmic structures of this work. 22 layers and they go on for 140 pages. Don't worry, the piece isn't 140 <laughs> pages. <laughs> and the, then I apply secondary procedures to them, which either brings out the particularity of the rhythmic process at that moment on that level, or seeks to obscure it by eliminating it in favor of something else. So really, that's what's happening at that moment. You, you're, you've got a, a sort of mental rubber, <coughs> and you're, you're rubbing out things. And you're meant to feel time differently, because when time is filling um, itself up with lots of activity. Uh, that's one thing, but when that activity disappears and time is left in a sort of naked form as a, as a polyphonic sort of counter entity uh, with the material, that's the moment when we perceive time most, most clearly. And that's always been something which fascinates me. Well, um the work um, is uh, clearly a, a very difficult work to put together, but it seems like it's so effortless to the ensemble. It seems that they're doing a really uh, uh, fantastic job for me from the outside. And I'm just wondering about that process of uh, putting it together. How do you get started on, on a work like this when you receive it? <coughs> well, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, on the page, it looks, it looks extremely difficult. Um, there are aspects of it that are that could be daunting to look at just in terms of sort of the, the, the varied rhythms upon rhythms that need to be revealed in the rehearsal process. But the, you know, the, the members of the group are just, they're so good and so smart and so uh, prepared that at the first rehearsal, it's, it's possible to just steam, full steam ahead and really work on the, the things that I, from studying, feel that I need to accomplish. So. And I, you know, it's, I don't, I try to analyze the piece as much as I can. Obviously, I can't get into the mind of the composer completely or even nearly in terms of, uh, you know, really all the procedures, procedural stuff. But, you know, Brian writes such beautiful phrases and the ideas of sectional, the section stuff, the sectional architecture, the way the, the piano reveals each time the new section or the, or the, uh, 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 the uh, electric keyboard, as he says. You know, those are the kind of things that are, and, and then the, the, the materials as they're 
you know, the, the, the dual materials that are happening or the, and then have the feedback you have to build back up again. I mean, those are things that I can, that I can see very clearly. And then there are rhythmic things that I need to make sure are, are together. There are pitch things that I want to make sure that I tune that everyone's aware of when pitch is coming together, coming apart. So there, you know, there are all these just, those are all just basic musical nuts and bolts things that we are, that's what we do. Sure, sure. So um, they're, fortunately, they're so prepared that it makes it very easy. Now, once a composer enters the picture, then things are even more revealed from his point of view. He can really talk to us about his process and the things that really need to be more carefully taken care of that I may have missed. Is, uh, there, is there any uh, sort of a general thing that you might say about when, uh, when Brian entered that uh, conversation, what, what sorts of things came to the fore? Well, I think he's particularly eloquent about what he, what he's, what he's done, what he's made, and what he needs to hear from what's, what's on the page. Some composers are very obtuse about, you know, the, the, or, or less than able to even communicate with the, with the group, but his, he's, he has an amazing ability to tell you exactly what you need to, to find the character, find the, you know, those things are, those, those things are important. Well, should perhaps add to that that um, a work of this size, not the, not the length of it, but the number of instruments, is pe peculiarly sensitive to the performers knowing what's going on. If you're in a string quartet, you work together and you discuss things, and um, you come to an agreed interpretation on that basis. But if you've got, say, 10 or 12 performers, it's neither chamber music nor orchestra, yeah. and the composer has to take note of that and act accordingly. And it was good for us to know what he needed to hear in terms of balance. You know, our sense of uh, four or five Ps up to three, four, you know, to three Fs, that, that space, how it's filled, he was very uh, helpful in saying, like, this is what my idea of three P is at this point. This is the voice that I need to hear, how the, the balance should work. Very helpful in balancing. Um, Did you feel that there was much um, adaptation that had to be done to your approach to playing it uh, once you arrived in Washington? Uh, well, we've slowed it down a little bit, I think, because of the room. The room is, is so bright, it's so, and I think it, it's it's bad, it's good for it's good exercise for me because I tend to sometimes my slow tempos tend to be a little on the fast side, which is a bad habit that I'm getting into as I get older. I think, but I used to be proud of being able to do music slowly, but I'm getting worse at it. <laughs> but I mean, it's really we've it, it's expanded out. It feels really nice. I mean, I feel like the open the <coughs> open the piece up here more than I mean in New York. You know, the rehearsal studio we have is. Uh, it's not. It's a. It's nice to have a rehearsal studio in New York City. That's your own dedicated space. And I would never put that down. But it's a very. It's a smallish, very strident, ugly, <laughs> ugly room. <laughs> <laughs> Sound. And the piano we have is not a very good instrument, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And so to get in here in a beautiful room with a, with a beautiful piano that's making you know that's generating. Um, I'm wondering if we can uh, 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 take a step back for a moment. Uh, I heard an anecdote earlier today um, uh, about a performance of uh, Cassandra's Dream Song in which you um, uh, demonstrated on the flute. <laughs> and so I, I guess I'm wondering if you could say um, a few words about your, um, your experience from the, uh, as a former slut and how that in, in impacted uh, well, um, it's strange really. The flute has always been the instrument I've, I've written most for, I suppose, in this community. Well, there have been, I don't know, seven or eight solo pieces, uh, or a piece with a significant flute in anyway. Um, I never had a lesson in my life on the flute. I learned it, I picked it up myself at school. Um, there was a heap of military band equipment which my uh, music teacher had piled, or he used to be the director of the local um, band in the wartime circumstances. And he um, piled all these instruments which were broken. They were sometimes old with half the keys missing or indeed of models which no longer are being built anyway. And um, I went in there and I took a flute and I took an oboe and I took a clarinet and I stuck them together again. I, I repaired them. I put rubber bands where I couldn't find springs. <laughs> and I started learning to play them. And um, the reason that, well, this, this funny thing about Cassandra's Dream Song, this is, the first, my first flute, flute solo piece I wrote in 1970. Um, I had just moved from England to Switzerland and was living in the town of Basel. And um, 
I only had a very small room, of course. I was a graduate student at that time in the um, conservatoire. And um, the flute was the only instrument that realistically I could take with me. No piano, no trumpets, which was my other instrument. Uh, and so, when I came to start a new piece, it was obvious that I did it on the basis of the instrument that I had available. Mm -hmm. And I could work everything out. And in fact, it was that particular piece. It shouldn't, you shouldn't be too impressed by my picking up the instrument and playing it for someone else. It's the only one of my flute pieces that, in fact, I could ever play. <laughs> <laughs> did that, um, did that knowledge kind of set the, the tone for how you would approach uh, dealing with Turning, come, coming to intimate knowledge of, of each instrument that you write for, because it seems like that's, that's just something that you very clearly possess. Right? Well, you can't write difficult music unless you know what the degree of difficulty is that you're asking people to, to deal with, both the conductor and performers. If you can't tell um, a, a, an oboe player or a trombone player, try this position instead of that position, um, you're not do, you, 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 it means you haven't done your homework, essentially. And Many things, by learning instrumental technique very precisely, many things become available, become opened <coughs> up to you that wouldn't have been obvious if you just followed the, 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 the basic trail of most travel. Um, I, th I think one thing that I, I'm always just interested in asking composers is what they're up to now and what they might be, uh, what's on the horizon in the, um, maybe there's another theatrical operatic work and you know, that, that sort of... What am I doing? Um, well, at my age, it's probably not good to ask people to look too far in the future. Um, I'm doing a piece uh, based upon a rereading of the vile consort <coughs> pieces of Christopher Tide, the English Renaissance composer. And I'm going to do 10 of those. I've done several already each of which will approach the original material, the, the um, in nomine domine plain chant, in a different way. Because the interesting thing is that these, these plain chants are totally modal. They're not dramatic in any way. They don't fit in with my musical uh, ideas at all. So it was, it's been challenging for me to make each one of these little pieces and its rereading of the original that I'm using at that moment. Um, examine different aspects of the original than one might expect. For instance, the one I'm doing now is for solo cello. And um, what I did was, the only, the only thing that I take from the original is the in nomine domine theme, which you have to use. Uh, and I counted up all the notes that occur. It's in five parts, so a lot of notes. And I counted up all the notes in every measure. And the number of notes in every measure went from three to like 17 and back again. Um, I used that as an, as an input instruction for how many notes would follow one of the in nomine domine pitches. So you get a pitch and then you get a, a flurry of other pitches, doesn't matter how they're created, say 15, because that measure has 15 notes in it. Now that's got nothing to do whatsoever with the music of Christopher Tye, apart from in a, in a very vague uh, density way as you know with, with polyphonic music of that sort, it will start with few notes, it will build up typically like to measure 30 or something to a, to a very high density and then it will fall off again to a, a slightly less density to the end and these things happen all the time. So at least I, kn I knew that I would have a sort of curve of densities to work with. So what seemed like a, um, might seem like an arbitrary thing actually has this very clear um, projection into what uh, the possibilities are in composer. Yeah, and every one of the pieces does something different. So you're, it's like one of those old, um, those old pinball machines. If you're very skilled at it, you can do something, you get more money out of it or points out of it than somebody else. And um, that's what we try to do. We try to, composers try to create um, elevated pinball machines. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, pinball machine? <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, I'm, I, I am not a gambler myself. <laughs> um, is there a chance that you'd be uh, working on another theatrical project down the road, uh, another opera or something like that? Nobody's those asked me for one, and uh, nobody had asked me for one when I sat down to write my first one. I have to explain that my first one was like 10 years ago. And it was a piece called Shadow Time, and it was in fact done in New York um, around that period. 
and it deals with the, with the life and death of the German Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin, who has always been someone I've, I've uh, felt some sort of affinity for. He was a very, very chaotic individual in his life, if not in his thinking. And um, I, I'm always proud of the fact that this opera is probably the only one ever written in which the main character dies at the end of the first scene. <laughs> and he, his avatar, or his spirit, wanders the underworld in various ways after, thereafter. Um, so was it an opera? Well, that's the question. Uh, I was asked by the Munich Biennale to write a piece, and they said, well, they, they, they commission only opera. So I said, okay, um, opera, yes. But you know, many, many of the early theatre works, things like Intermedi at the Florentine Court and things like that, uh, they were written, they, that was a collaborative action by several composers. Some, some guy wrote the ballet, some guy wrote the, the, the songs. You had to do it that way, otherwise you'd never, you'd never do it. Um, and there were a lot of religious uh, cantatas which border on the uh, dramatic in the conventional sense, even though the characters have names like virtue or spite or something like that. So I think the interesting thing about opera for me is not opera as such, but the idea that you can, you've got a theatre of the mind, and this theatre of the mind can be illuminated with a, a feeble torch, perhaps, or a, even a, just a match. In fact, Helmut Lachenmann's uh, little match girl just psh, the sound of a match illuminating was the structure of the whole piece. So, yeah, um, I always said I wouldn't write an opera because I didn't know anything about human beings. But luckily, the human beings were all dead. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, that doesn't answer your question. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. I, mi I might be interested in doing a chamber one. This was a very big one. I might be interested in doing something which, rather like the Commedia dell'arte, has four or five players and four or five singers. Well, one of the, I mean, you had a, a, an interesting collaboration with the librettist in that, in that case, too, which of all was more of a poetry in terms of. Uh, yes. Um, the very well-known poet, Charles Bernstein, a friend of mine. Um, he kindly agreed to write the lyric for this piece under the stringent rules that I imposed upon him. One of those rules was uh, every line must have this number of syllables and no more and no less. So there, there were patterns. Uh, also that um, uh, words in principle should be uh, permutable, that you could change the order of words in a line and still have some sense come out of it. And um, the third, the third um, constraint was that he would be able to publish it as a book. Because you know, so many opera texts are shamefully illiterate. Maybe just belongs to the genre, but some of them are really, really, really bad. Like a lot of the texts used for madrigals. Hey, lasso. So, um, so I, I wanted it to be poetry that he would feel comfortable about in spite of me imposing these limitations upon him. And indeed, he did do it. Um, I think before we get to uh, taking some questions from the audience, um, uh, you're playing this, you're performing this work again fairly soon in New York, is that right? Yes, uh, next uh, Wednesday night. Um, what type of uh, space? What kind of a what kind of a situation is that compared compared to this? And um, uh uh, it's a th it's it's in a theater in Brooklyn, I think, called Roulette, which is it's a pretty good sized room. It's a ball. I think it was a ballroom in a hotel at one point or something. It has a, a balcony that goes around and a, and a, f a floor for seating and a, and a proscenium type stage that's extended out to hold larger groups. So it's not as big as I don't think it holds as many people as this auditorium, but it's uh, not a small space. And it's, it's the, I'm hoping that they don't do what they normally do there, which is uh, they, have a, they have this uh, alarming tendency to amplify everything slightly. Everything, no matter what. And uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to hope that they don't, uh, to find out that they're trying to make them not do that. We also and have to uh, fight against that impulse. Uh, yeah, that's an well. impulse that's out there now that's just a, it's really disconcerting. And it turns into a really, it turns into you know, for those of us that, I mean, you know, I, I love, uh, I love uh, amplified music, but I, I, you know, if you deal most uh, strictly with uh, acoustic music, it's just, a, it's just, a, oh, it's a horror. So, 
Well, we're so pleased that um, that it's going to have a second performance so quickly following the first. Oh yeah, no, no we're we're looking forward. To it. I mean, that's it's always great to be able to play something that you work so hard on, you know, as many times as possible. I hope we, I hope this, this piece is. Uh, I hope we give it a lot. A lot it has a chance to grow with the oh, players yeah. too. Oh absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's already starting to feel a little more organic. Well, it has to get to the point where instead of saying, no, that tempo was 67 and not 63, you say it, go, it goes like this. In other words, the, the conductor himself is not thinking in these rigorous ratio relationships with right. your bass time, but you know how the music goes. Exactly. It's a sort of shorthand to actual personal reliving forth, as it were, yeah. of what's in the material. And for me, it becomes really, it really becomes a physical, I feel it in my body, I feel it in my bones, I feel the move, I feel the piece move in my body. And once I get to the place where it feels right, and it's right with Brian, then I, that's a, that's, that's a good feeling. Right, well, for sure. Well, um, why don't we take some questions from the audience, anybody? We have a microphone that'll come to you. Thank you very much. Your comments, all three of your comments, were very, very interesting, um, especially because the library has a new, um, a new uh, practice of sending out the program notes the day or before. And I noticed that you did not want to give an extensive program note to to to, to this piece. I found that very interesting, and, and I also noticed that your piece takes up unless it's been changed, one half of the, it, it's after the intermission. And, and I was wondering, with, with the commission from the three organizations, um, did you feel you were being asked for a, a, a longer piece? How, could you uh, extend no, no. a little bit what you, what you said? Because I would somewhat be encouraged, if it's a short piece, as you said, to hear it twice here and, and not you know, have to go up to, to, to Zurich or to Brooklyn to hear it. A well, second time, so yeah, strictly speaking, the, the tradition in, in these commissioning things is that the commissioning body, by and large, states the instrumentation which they want you to write for. Not necessarily right down to the very last guitar string, but in general terms, and you know what the ensemble's got. And um, the other thing... Huh. Yes, duration, thank you, good Lord. Yes, it's been a long week. Um, they also s specified duration. I had a terrible time with the Festival de Temps in Paris three or four years ago, where um, um, for one reason or another, the, uh, the organizer thought that uh, my piece was two and a half minutes too short. <laughs> and uh, they're very upset. And of course, uh, if it's going to be broadcast live on the radio, as in, many, in France many things are, um, yes, what are you going to fill two and a half minutes with? Um, but in fact, it was conducted very, very fast. But that's, you know, the composer's always the one who takes the flat, finally. <laughs> no, uh, tw it, it's interesting, though, with contemporary music. I think we've got pieces which are very short in contemporary music today, and we've got pieces which are not enormously long, and that wasn't really always the case in the, in the high, uh, high serial or modernist period. I think there are many different approaches we can take now, uh, if feeling our way, as it were, with the somatic mechanisms of our body, the sinews of time, through a particular sort of argument. So yes, 20 minutes, well, it's 19 and a half minutes, this one. Perfect, I'm sorry, if I could just quickly, could you give us a few more benchmarks within the, you talked about there's 12 little things at the beginning and there's the counter pointing forces. Could you give us a few other things to listen to through that? Well, what you'll hear is different, um, <coughs> You'll hear different types of combinations of instruments. It's a very uh, colourful ensemble. And the big challenge was, of course, to use two percussionists, because in general, um, the integration of percussion into chamber music has always been a somewhat um, problematic issue. And when you've got two of them, then you've really got to think what it is you're going to do with them. Hence, I wanted to build in the, the steel drums and one or two other little things. So my music, if I use percussion, my music tends to change color very quickly. Um, I don't just stick with marimba and vibraphone all the way through. I, you'll hear all sorts of things going on, ratchets and, and things. 
which sound rather strange. Um, so that would be something to listen to, to, to try and feel. Uh, the piano is quite clear, but um, the percussion, in a sense, are a double avatar in, in negative, if it were, in retrograde, of what the, the pianist is doing, because they appear mainly in the other sections. And so uh, each of the sections is characterized by a particular grouping and strategy of the percussion instruments available. Oh, and other, uh, other things are, for instance, um, subsets of the ensemble. The, the first appearance of the second material is actually for woodwind quintet. It's not something I think we think about, but it does happen to be like that, and that's the way I, I planned it. And there's a, there's a quite interesting little uh, poignant fragment for string quartet later on in the piece. Well, I'm not sure it's poignant, but it's string quartet. <laughs> <laughs> So whilst uh, it is true that there are, there are large twitties in the piece where um, many, many things are going on at the same time, I do uh, urge you to look to see how many instruments are playing, which instruments are playing. Um, certainly with the first material, you'll be able to do that very well. But with the second, um, the argument is a little bit an, at an angle, if you like. It's not, it's not directly source to ear but it's going through um, a windy sort of Merbius strip type uh, twisty motion in order to bring it where it needs to go. Um, if, uh, wait until the, uh, there's a question up here. Um, my takeaway from that also is that uh, we're over 30 seconds, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, can tell you. Oh, I, can add, I can add 30 seconds easily. <laughs> So you mentioned that you don't uh, you don't care for the culinary analogies, but you've been using a lot of mathematical, and you just interjected Mobius strip. Um, are there any sort of mathematical cues, um, themes that you used in sections of this piece? Um, well, I do. Uh, yes, this is uh, a problem for you because you don't get lots of nice sketches to look at. Uh, uh, I work with two screens on my desk. One is calculational screen which uses a uh, patchwork which is a, um, a, a mathematical to musical interface program uh -huh. and on the right screen is uh, me writing down the score that results in layers of these original processes. So yes, um, before about 1992 everything was done by hand. Um, after that point gradually I went across to uh, trying to codify some of the procedures that I'd, I'd used ad hoc in earlier pieces like canonic structure, for instance, mm -hmm. um, in a way that a computer could, could um, chew on and come up with many different strategies for dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do do that. Mm -hmm. But there aren't many sketches now. <laughs> <laughs> so do the musicians kind of chafe now more than they used to because you have all of these, th having the technical tools could get you down the rabbit's hole fairly quickly. Um, well, when I first started doing electronic um, calculation for my instrumental music, uh, they said, what did you want to do? I was at Eartown in Paris at the time, and uh, so I'd gone to do a, a little three months of residency and do something. And I said, what I want this thing to do is what I've done already by hand, because otherwise, how will I judge its efficacy? You've got to know You've got to own the procedures that you've employed to get satisfactory, subjectively satisfactory results. Um, the only thing that a program does for you, it gives you a hundred choices instead of working two weeks to produce one choice. Mm -hmm. um, that might be seen to be somewhat trivializing of, of compositional invention, but I think that's not so. I mean, we always react with some sort of preferential sensibility with whatever type of material we've got, no matter how voluminous. There's a, another question back there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> I, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your piece, um, as I think we all are. Um, and uh, I also hear what you said at the beginning, or toward the beginning, about uh, 
program music and the danger. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, I understand it's impossible to produce any piece of music to an outside program. Uh, and, I, and I also haven't heard the piece yet, obviously. That being said, I, I found what you did write uh, in terms of program notes quite fascinating, and I, and I wanted to offer just a few comments for your reaction, even if it's to excoriate what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, and uh, the first comment, I'm probably much too involved in the everyday here, but um, your third paragraph, and thinking of a career in Washington, I couldn't help but be reminded of our current national politics, to be honest. <laughs> Well, uh, I have to emphasize very politely and circumspectly to you that I am not an American national. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm just relating perhaps somewhat to your consciousness uh, how this struck one American this, this evening. Uh, and my apologies, you can excoriate me if you want. No, no, not at all. I mean, I'm... Uh, I've always contrived to live in countries where I never had the boat. I think <laughs> there must be a reason for that. But this is pr probably providing us with more of a reason than we might like. <laughs> May we live in interesting times, as the Chinese curse. Well, well, in a more general sense, I mean, I'd be very interested to hear this when you speak of. Uh, of uh, obstinately pitting two aggressively distinct musical character types against each other. It just makes me wonder if it's expressive somehow of the world we're living in or living through. I, again, uh, probably much too simplistic. But, uh, um, we, we, as I said earlier on, we like to think that music has a relevance over and beyond just making sounds in, in the air. Like any, um, any form of ordered intellectual or inventive pr procedure, I think music surely can bring forth these things, but I think it's the deeper reflection upon what in the, okay, this, this is what, what makes art interesting is that it deals with the general in the particular. So uh, depends which of these poles you're going out from. If you, uh, if you say, okay, all music should be accessible because it should be tonal or it should be modal or it would have regular rhythms, well, that's a very general prescription. But then there's no piece in the world that could ever live up to that, um, to, the, to, the, to the 100% of those strictures because, just for logical reasons, that it would not be an individual piece if it lived up to all those strictures. It would be a, a, a general expression of the general. And a piece of music uh, is always internally dissonant in the sense that um, those general aspects should ideally inform our listening to some extent, but it's the particularities of the work which lend wings to the retention and reworking of those um, impressions after the piece is finished. And I think it's very important, that rather like a perspectival vanishing point, Sometimes the vanishing point can be off the canvas, it could be somewhere else. And, or if you've got a fragment where the arm is missing, you can extrapolate the, frag the, the, the arm, but not exactly where the arm was, but it, the sort of armness of, the, of that situation. So, yeah, we have to, I, I, of course I believe there are general things which, which will uh, allow the individual listener to, to confront, confront certain aspects of, of present day experience. But at the same time, it wouldn't be of any value. I could write an article for Time magazine then, I suppose, if I had not, not composed music. If you didn't counterpoise, and I'm back to this word again, um, the largely passive background of generality with the very spiky and specific invention of a particular piece. You said it much better than I could, and thank you for indulging me. Well, at greater length, I'm sorry about that. No, it. thank you for indulging me. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe I know you've done uh, a piece or two, at least four, uh, that involve electronics. Um, am I correct to say that you have not yet done a strictly electroacoustic composition? No. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. In okay. fact, what, how would you know? Okay. Um, okay. Well, I, I had the work about five, six years ago. I did 
uh, I finally uh, decided that whilst I didn't want to do extremely sophisticated electronic um, generation using God knows how much uh, software, what I did was I, I gathered together all the dreadful deadbeat programs you can get off the internet free of charge <laughs> and wrote music using only those. Um, so yes, some bits pretty gruesome. <laughs> But it's, it's, it, one of them has been played in public several times. One of them only at Stanford in a, um, um, one of their Friday afternoon weirdness sessions. <laughs> I, I wouldn't call myself an electronic composer. Though. I mean, I'd use electronics in other pieces, like a choral piece, which is part of the opera, um, which, uh, in which the singing then triggers um, um, attacks of different types of sonic material as the piece goes on, transforming into the voice so that the two come together in a sort of alluvial flow. Yes. The reason I ask is because I notice your, your music is highly specific rhythmically, and I would think that with the emergence of electronics, um, this allows for that to be much, uh, your music be performed with perfection. Um, do you, perhaps the reason that you might not do strictly electronic music because you like the concept of the performers having that, I guess, the, um, I don't know, the, you might say the struggle or the, the, mm -hmm. the human aspect to, to it. Well, I don't, I don't like the word perfection. I think that was a scientificist view of the 1950s and early 60s in America, uh, a, a sort of subclass of the European serial system, which uh, uh, came to uh, reside in American u universities only because the people concerned could convince the uh, appointment committees that these were objectively, objectively <laughs> valuable principles, yes? Um, so it's a pity, but that, that in fact was what happened. So, uh, I was going to, yes, perfection. Um, what would be a perfect rendition? Uh, I don't believe that there is such a thing, first of all, and B, uh, I think this is something, you know, we've talked about, uh, that fidelity to the intention of the piece, rather than pre precise rendition of what's there, is what we're really talking about. It's, it's something which has a surplus of, of, of energizing potential over and beyond the mere replicative. There was a piece, um, an Italian piece many years ago by a guy called Paolo Castaldi. We don't need to say any more about it. But, he called it Für Elisa. <laughs> and he, you open the score, and you see this incredibly contorted, quasi-serial, multiple irrational values piled up on top of each other, tempo changes every two beats, and, and things like this. What, what? But what he was doing was very clever. He had taken a recording of uh, an interpretation of Fiora Lisa, the Beethoven bit, and he had transcribed it as best he could into contemporary musical notation. All the notes were exactly in the place where the performer was playing them. So, so um, what is it we interpret in the Beethoven piece? We interpret 20 generations no, no reason that's not, not a good thing. Um, tradition, that's why tradition in the arts is very powerful. And um, so just because you see a notation that is very exact, it doesn't mean that I'm looking for that sort of scientific exactitude um, because I don't think that my mind at least works in that particular way. It works in a sort of gestalt way. You put things together because they belong together. And there are generalized rules, no doubt, from gestalt philosophy which would allow us to, to examine that, but I don't bother. I just write the music. <laughs> so, I, yeah, per perfect, no, no. Um, you know, the exhilaration of a live performance is always something which is totally different from a studio recording, as I'm sure you're aware. And um, whilst they have their benefits, indeed, um, I'm happy to take whatever circumstantial um, incidentalities apply in a live performance. 
anytime. Thank you. Let's just take one last uh, question. Um, my sense is that your piece is written out exactly the way you want it. There's not chance elements or anything in it. Well, only so far as any music, is, uh, any, any, human <laughs> any human activity is, is shot through with chance elements. <laughs> no, there are no, everything is precisely notated, okay. yes. And one other question, which is you mentioned that there's some microtonal yes. elements in it, and I was wondering what the purpose of that was, because some people use that for the purpose of approximating just intonation. Or well, um, you know, there are different sorts of microtones, and they uh, make possible different sorts of realistically attainable um, results. Quarter tones are usually pretty good, as long as you don't try to sing a, a, a small perfect fifth. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just that I had a pupil once in a course, he came uh, with a piece for four singers, and he'd written it in 24 tones, sister. And uh, there was absolutely no way uh, that you were going to sing a C here and an F three quarter sharp there. It just doesn't work that way for our ears. We're not constructed that way. So, that, so you can do a 12-tone piece, but you can't do a 24-tone piece, and that's the reason. So what you've got to do is to decide where the limit is. In other words, not where you don't use microtones, but um, you have to decide. Uh, it's a sort of cost-effect analysis. You have to, if you've got a 12-tone piece, which goes ding, 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 well, yes, you hear the first five sounds, but you don't hear the last seven sounds, but they're still part of the 12-tone row structure. So, um, your, it, whilst it seems to be an objective um, uh, method, as Schoenberg would have said, not system, method, um, our ears uh, don't deal with those seven notes the same way as they do the five notes. And that's exactly true of microtonal writing. So it's, it, it's incumbent upon the composer, in my view, to provide a sort of uh, rough and ready scale of a possible appreciation for, for microtonal writing. As I said, the piano here, uh, the keyboard, does use third and sixth tones, and these are very natural intervals in the overtone series, but they don't sound natural when you put them on a, on a keyboard. So uh, what shall I say? Uh, uh, Goal-directed defamiliarization. <laughs> On that note, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, attending this talk and for the good questions. And also, if you could join me in thanking uh, Brian Fernho and James Baker. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.